Colin O'Keefe here for LXBN TV. In an important ruling, the Supreme Court handed a bit of a victory to financial institutions as it ruled Chapter 7 debtors cannot strip off junior liens on underwater home loans. Joining us to explain exactly what all this means is attorney Alex Dugan. She's with Bradley Arant, Bolt Cummings, and author on their blog, Financial Services Perspectives. Uh, Alex, first off, for those of us who aren't you know, completely up to speed with the ruling, can you explain you know, what exactly happened? What's the backstory? You know, what's what's the ruling basically here? Sure, Colin. Well, the facts in Colcat are really, they're pretty simple. You have a Chapter 7 bankruptcy case. The debtor in that case, when he filed for bankruptcy, his um, he had two mortgages on his home. At the time of the filing, the value of the home was actually less than the outstanding debt on that first mortgage. So the second mortgage was, in fact, considered wholly underwater. So the debtor in his bankruptcy case filed a motion and was essentially trying to avoid that second lien entirely. Uh, the bankruptcy court um, found that he could do that. And then subsequently, the 11th Circuit actually affirmed that decision. But on Monday of this week, the Supreme Court reversed in a virtually unanimous and relatively short opinion. Um, there really wasn't any dispute in the Colcat case as to whether that second mortgage holder actually had an allowed claim. The dispute, in fact, centered on the question of whether that claim was secured. Uh, as I mentioned before, the value of the home um, only covered that first mortgage. And so essentially the value of the second mortgage was zero. The collateral securing it was zero. So the question, you know, when you when you look at the the plain language of the bankruptcy code, one may believe it that it suggests in fact that the claim would not be secured however based on an earlier supreme court decision in the Duesnip case uh the the court ultimately concluded otherwise and so backing up a little bit to give a little history on the Duesnip case you basically have the same scenario that we had here in the Colquette case the one factual distinction being that that second mortgage was in fact partially underwater not wholly underwater as it was in Calcutt. So what the debtor attempted to do in Duesnip was essentially strip down uh, the value or the value of the second mortgage holder's claim to the value of that collateral. And the court in Duesnip ultimately ruled that the debtor could not do that because the claim was still secured by a lien. So under the bankruptcy code, that was not permitted. Following the Duesnip case, there ultimately ended up being a circuit split. Uh, some case, the majority of cases and the of circuits followed the reasoning in Duesnip in this situation we have in Colquette. So the situation where you have a Chapter 7 debtor who has a wholly uh, underwater second mortgage and the majority of these cases following Duesnip said no, the debtor cannot strip off that lien. However, there were a number of cases in the 11th Circuit, Colquette being one of them, where the court found that the debtor could strip it off. And so that that's really where we came to with the Colquette decision. But the Supreme Court's ruling on Monday really has now resolved that circuit split. I see. And then second, you know, of course, you know, looking forward now, what's the impact on all of this? You know, what's the takeaway uh, for people involved in this type of thing? Well, I think, you know, you said it well when you said this really can be viewed as a victory uh, for financial institutions, in particular junior mortgage holders. Uh, one thing that this ruling does highlight is the continued uh, disparity in treatment between wholly underwater second mortgages in Chapter 13 and Chapter 7 cases. In Chapter 13 cases, the debtor can actually seek to avoid that wholly underwater second mortgage, either via motion or adversary proceeding. Um, but a Chapter 13 case is very different. The debtor has to commit disposable income to a plan. And then the debtor has to complete its plan and successfully receive a discharge before that lien would be stripped off. And uh, there really is a relatively low success rate in Chapter 13 cases. So this relief isn't certainly isn't a slam dunk for debtors. Um, this is very different than a Chapter 7 case where a debtor does not have to commit disposable income. And most Chapter 7 debtors can typically get a discharge within a few months of the filing. In terms of other uh, other impacts to lenders and borrowers, today's or um, sorry Monday's ruling could could potentially uh, trigger a shift in some borrowers choosing to file Chapter 13 instead of 7 
to seek to um, to obtain uh, lien stripping of their wholly underwater second mortgage. We likely would only see that in cases and in the 11th circuit so alabama florida and georgia because as i mentioned before those were really the cases where the courts were holding the other way um, another another area where we may see an impact is a a shift in loss mitigation negotiations the junior mortgage holders now may get uh, a bit more of leverage at the negotiating table when they're sitting with chapter 7 debtors and uh, first mortgage holders because they no longer can seek the relief uh, that the debtor in way back in the bankruptcy court did at Colcad. Uh, and finally, despite this victory for lenders, it's important to kind of read between the lines of this case. Uh, like I mentioned before, it was a relatively short case. There was one footnote, and this footnote was joined by all the justices except for Justice Breyer, Kennedy, and Sotomayor. And the footnote essentially pointed out all of the significant criticism of the Duesna case that has uh, that have been made by commentators since it was decided. And in particular, the footnote also mentioned the fact that the debtors throughout oral arguments and briefing, they not only didn't ask the court to overturn Duesna, but in fact, they reiterated many times that that was not the relief they were seeking for. Uh, so this footnote really leaves open the question of if had it been done differently and had the debtors asked the court to overturn Duesnip, potentially we might have had uh, a different result. Potentially there may have been some appetite for overturning Duesnip. However, as I mentioned, this case really did resolve the circuit split. So I think it's unlikely that we're gonna see this issue back up again in front of the Supreme Court. Very interesting. Yeah, it seems like it it uh, put the issue to rest here just a little bit, but still it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how these types of mortgages are dealt with, at least in some respects in the future. Uh, once again, that was attorney Alex Dugan of Bradley Arant Bolt Cummings for more uh, of her insight, insight from her colleagues as well. Be sure to visit BABC-FinancialServicesPerspectives.com. Thank you for joining me today, Alex. Thanks, Colin.